I'm Dan DeMont, so, but before we do that, I wanted to bring up a slide of what I did 37 years ago. I, Daniel Douglas DeMont, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Senate, and that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me, according to regulations and the Uniform Code of Military Justice, to help you God. What I, when I said it and I raised my hand and spoke those words is that every time after that initial time, that the feeling I had when I took that oath to defend the country of the United States. So those who may go and honor or join the military regardless of what service is that there is an oath and a creed and a duty that you must follow. And I did it for more than 20 years and every time I rose my hand for every enlistment, my, the hair on the back of my neck always rose. So if we look at who am I, any one of you can get on your phones, because how many of you actually have a phone with you, all right? So, 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 uh, so we make sure that while I'm up here, we don't text or talk, right? You could Google me and find out all kinds of things. Who am I? You can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Facebook. You could see that I've been in the news and that I talked about different things, and it goes all the way back to whenever, all right? Now, when the advent of internet is you know, an invention of somebody, but we were using it in the DOD back in the 80s to communicate information. So you can look and Google me and find so many things else. So what the military gave me in that time is it gave me a set of values, it showed me responsibility and courage, and all, one of the things it was is about honor. So the thing about honor is everything else that I do is that I have to honor something that I believe and trust in. And that's the way that I carried my life. So the meaning of it all, of anybody that does join the military or anything else in any profession, that there's usually a creed, a code, a loyalty system, a respect, anything sort of that. And this is what has carried me through my lifetime to current date. So we talk about respect, honesty, trust, and loyalty, is that respect is gained. All right, loyalty is returned because of respect. So if we look at it as a soldier, I am, I am and always will be a soldier until the day I die. I am a professional and if I read the creed correctly, there is no one more professional than I will ever be. I am a warrior and a member of a team. My success is reliant on those who surrounded me in my career. So my success in the military is because of the people that I led. And then I made others successful because I was in their team and helped them become successful. I always place mission first, regardless if I agree or disagree, is that it has to be done and it needs to be accomplished. I will never defeat except defeat. I may have to take a few steps backwards I might have to regroup, but I will not accept defeat. I will never leave a comrade behind or a coworker. I will always come back. I will always rescue, and then always, and I will always remain guardian of the freedoms of the way of my life, of our lives. And I, that is proven through what I've done after my retirement in the military. I retired and went to work for the Department of Homeland Security, FEMA. I started at the local level, went through the state, did assignments for DHS, and decided, hey, I better go teach. So I went to Texas A&M for eight years, doing the same thing. And then they convinced me to come to the great state of Mississippi, to the beautiful city of Hattiesburg, to work here at the University of Southern Mississippi. So if we look at the technology timeline, and I'm gonna take you through a little collage that I built and trust me, for me to be able to make that little video and these next couple of videos created some more gray hair than I already have on my head, all right? So if you think about it, all of you youngins looking at me probably say I'm ancient. And when I was your age, guess what? I thought I was, if I was to hear somebody of my own age, 
I would have thought the same thing. All right, so what you take for granted today was something we saw in cartoons and something we saw in movies like Mission Impossible and Uncle and something and something. But if you look at it, technology as a kid when I grew up is I had the X Echo Sketch. And that was really cool. I had Rock'em Sock'em Robots, followed by that Spirograph thing, and I spent hours doing that. LinkedIn Logs. I think you still can get these. All right? We went to space. Our school let us out to watch it on television. We didn't think we were going to go to space. And then we had a president before this mission that said, it's what can we do for our country, but not what the country can do for us. And what I remember is that they promised me I would have a flying car. I'm still waiting. And you will see my flying car throughout the presentation. The first supercomputer, we walked on the moon, and so on and so forth. So in the 60s, we made leaps and bounds. Then the 70s came. All right, everybody remembers the 70s? My father was a, a police officer. He was a cop for 37 years. And he talks about, well, he used to talk about the 70s, about the peace, love, rock and roll, and drugs. And he didn't understand the drugs, but he liked the rock and roll and the love. So we spent like that. We had our first digital watch, a microwave oven that probably weighed 700 pounds. <laughs> Seriously. We had arcades. I played pinball. We had Pong. So everybody know what Pong is, right? You know, I got my first cable TV. We had a little thing that we could play Pong, and I spent hours playing Pong on the television with my brothers and sisters. They told me I was going to be able to read this, the Kindle from the 70s, all right? The Star Wars. Everybody a big fan of Star Wars? This was some technology, the Star Wars um, heart defibrillator, video telephone, and of course, the Apollo 16 mission and the advancements of NASA looking at continuous space travel and so on and so forth through the, sh the shuttle. So we move into the 80s. The 80s is when I joined the military. So trust me, I was ex exposed to a lot of technology. The first floppy disk was we had that big one, and then we had a five and a quarter, and then three and a half, and then all of a sudden, they started giving me sticks to plug into side, all right? Gave us brain. This is how much a hard drive was, $3,098 for 10 megabits. Think about it. They had the technologies that were advanced, the electric shaver. Uh, Atari came out with a reactive, the new uh, operating system. This was a game from Atari to be able to practice manipulation of robotics. A new Echo Sketch that Atari put out. The handheld video camera, and finally, I believe, the new Atari artist software to be able to draw and manipulate the three-pin mouse. Does anybody, I bet you none of you have ever seen a three-button mouse. All right, and of course, we were stuck there with the big boom box, <coughs> $1,300 for a computer that worked off 286. Does anybody know what a 286 is? Everybody has all these Pentiums and AMDs and all those things. And these are the movies I like, Westworld, Tron was futuristic, all right? And then, of course, this was the first virtual reality. Look at the size of it. Now what is it? Little goggles that you put on your face. And then again, where's my flying car? Because they promised it to me, all right? So then we moved to the 90s, and we had advancements in medical. So if we talk about STEM, it's more than just what we think as computers and mathematics. It covers all aspects. So we talk about that. We got Google Maps. When I joined the Army, my map test was a real map, a protractor and a compass. I wish I had Google Maps and some of the schools I went to. ABS braking systems, <clears throat> so on and so forth. A little digital music player. I had a Walkman that was an eight. Um, a cassette deck, and when, when I got my first car, which was a 1969 Cougar XRZ, it had an AM radio in it. My dad gave me an 8-track. He says, here, son, put this in your new car. Went to Kmart, and they had cassette decks. 
in a week, I already had to spend more money than I made to be able to update it. And of course, we move into the drones, seedless watermelon, uh, so on and so forth, and then the super collider. When I came to work at USM and I was going through uh, my interview, and I sat down with a young man, and he's talking about the accelerator. With well, somebody with my background, I think of accelerators of taking two atoms, running them down a, a collider, have them go together and measure what the output. So when they said that USM had an accelerator, what's my first mind? We're going to have a collider. We, I didn't know Hattiesburg had a collider. To find out, it's about acceleration of technology. Of course, we changed code within <coughs> in the wor wide world web, the internet, wireless technology we, we discovered and enhanced. So how many of us today at home have something that's actually wired to the internet, to a, a router? But everything else in that household works what? Wirelessly. How many things can talk to that wireless network? Your refrigerator, your washer, your dryer. You can communicate and command everything from what? Your cell phone. Now remember my first cell phone came in a bag with a cord. And it lasted about, oh, I don't know, 20 minutes. But I couldn't afford to call anybody. It cost me $100 a minute. So that's what it is. And then in the last 25 years, the acceleration of technology. So make this video go. What's going on? So is there, is there audio? There's audio to all, but who cares? All right. Digital devices. So if you think about it, so when I was 17, 16, none of this. this is, we already did this, didn't we? All right, so let's go past it. So here are the, the trends of what we call science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And where do we fall in a world is fit. We used to be one. When I was in high school, it was about the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. I didn't know what a science class was until I hit eighth grade. I mean, we did stuff for science, but a real science lab with gas and lab tables and so on and so forth. So what it is is that other t and it, a lot of it's about pure numbers, the large number factor. And if you look at Japan, Indonesia, and those other countries, they have a whole lot more people than we do. So we take it as a pure large number factor that they will always be ahead of us because we don't have the population that they have. But our numbers through scores have dropped. So my goal is to hopefully inspire you all over the next two days is to maybe think about a career in one of those fields. Who here wants to be a computer engineer? Nobody. Nobody wants to work in the computer science? Programming? What's everybody want to be here? Marine biologist? What? Petroleum? So do you think that belongs in STEM? Yes, it does. So we all have to think about it. <laughs> so here's the military technology. This is not reality. That's the military of 2050. All right. But if you think about it, this is the Navy of 2050. In 1987, I was on a bombing mission, not a bombing mission, but a test mission for the Air Force. And they were testing a plane they called Hammer. So they were dropping bombs out in the west desert of Utah. And you can hear the ATC, the air traffic controller, say, where are you? So we're talking about STEF technology. So the B-117 bomber was flying over Utah. ATC didn't know where they were. They were flying over Salt Lake International Airport, which was creating some problems. All right, so that was in 1987. So that's what we were doing. Solving problems. So I teach a course, and we'll talk about that at the end of this presentation. It's called Hacking for Defense. It's about taking real day, real world problems and solving them in 15 weeks. They're from all different services, all different backgrounds, to take it and have it such as you all to be able to solve it in T of four. So to solve that problem, you must understand it. All right, you must understand the person who has the problem. And then you must ask them a hundred million different questions. 
All right, you take those questions, you implement and make corrections to your, to your hypothesis, and then guess what? You give it to them and ask them what? A hundred more questions. And it's cyclic in nature, so you gotta keep going back until the point it says, this works, this can, I can use this. All right, and you keep doing that until you find that. Make it challenging, because if you do, you have to analyze everything that you do. Ba, 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 ba. So if we talk about the cybersecurity challenges of this country, is everybody aware of the, the recent hack of everybody's credit information? All right, so somebody broke into one of the three credit reporting agencies and stole 148 million names. That's half the population of this country and sold it on the black market. I bet you all know the black web and the deep web better than I will ever know it, correct? Because you're already surfing it. You're looking, you can find things on the internet quicker than I could ever th think of. I could give you this phone, you'll be using it, doing things I ain't never knew it could do. All right? That's the way it is. So how do we do it? Because it, the world used to be this large thing, all right? And communications took for a while. Nowadays, communications is instantly, correct? All right, we can text, we can video text, we can do all these different things, but how many times is that, as we do that, is that we open up our, our processes to attack of those who wish to create harm upon us? So what is it is that we know that the hackers will not stop. They're not gonna stop, they never will. That's why the National Security Agency hires hackers. Hire the ones that attack you to fight the ones that are still attacking you. They're not gonna do it. We need to work together. It's a global problem. It's not just within the United States. So you need to be able to work together. Our houses are going to get smarter. One day you will have a bot that will get you a glass of water. And then maybe that bot will bring me my flying car, all right? So in to do that, we have to expand and make sure that the leaders understand those, that some of you will be great leaders in the military, leaders of corporations, leaders in community, is that you have to understand what is the threat and to be aware of those threats. And it starts with you all, not just, not the people currently doing it, but you're the future, all right? So we need to be able to do that. So what do we need? We need sp special uh, cybersecurity groups. There's more than 200,000 current openings within the cyber command or cybersecurity world. Whether it's analysts, people who write code, people that protect it, we need to do that. We have to protect our critical infrastructure within this nation because everything we rely on, your gas, your, your lighting, your, your food, you name it, mail, TV, communications, banking, is if we don't protect that, it'll be vulnerable and one day someone will take us down because we're not vulnerable and build such security things within it. So we need to be able to uh, increase our role and assure that as we expand and make things easier in life is that we think about implementing security measures as we develop it. How many here think they're gonna invent something in the next 10 years? Who has an idea? Did you raise your hand? You have an idea, right? Right, so, but you're all being quiet because you think, what? You say what? Yeah, so we gotta think about it. So that's what we do. The group is tasked with reaching out to experts on various topics. They are part of a newly launched Hacking for Defense course offered at the University of Southern Mississippi and only a few other universities across the country. They're taking students from mixed backgrounds and they're putting them in teams and getting them to look at some of the problems that the military has. And is there a way to figure out a better way to do this using the knowledge of students, technology, computing, business classes, whatever it is? Organizers of the course are looking to these students and what is signed up in classes across the U.S. to offer a different perspective on the challenges faced by enlisted soldiers. Plus, tours like this one to Camp Shelby provide a first-hand look at the work taking place on active military bases. 
One of the groups is looking at how to improve the efficiency of military drones in combat. And this interaction from drone pilots provides insight into how this unmanned technology is changing military strategy, both close to home and beyond U.S. borders. We have to introduce them to the, to the people that they're trying to develop problems for, but to look at that dual purpose solution for the commercial market, for uh, national defense for the country as well. And that also aids in getting them out to the field and uh, living a day in the life of the food for those people that actually do the job. During the course, students, most of them without a military background, learn how to employ the same problem-solving methods that have been developed on the battlefield of the Gulf War. And will work with personnel from the Department of Defense, Homeland Security, and the intelligence community. Students from other programs across the country have developed products that have now been marketed and used by soldiers as a result of the team exercises and method training, all aimed at improving the performance of soldiers serving and protecting our country. From the University of Southern Mississippi, I'm Lee Lassery. So that's hacking for defense. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you all a couple of questions. All right? It's going to be raise your hand or not. So how many believe they will pursue a career in technology? All right, who do you think, where's the greatest source of need right now within technology? You got, what do you think is going to grow beyond what we know it today? Geoscience. So he's saying, and this is what I was told as a kid too, that we'd live on the moon. Right? So those in my generation who remember being said we're going to live on the moon. So, so that is true. However, what have we done so much for space travel? You know, we stopped. Right? We stopped launching our own. So maybe we need to look at being able to do that. You had your hand up? So deep learning, all right. And by the way, you're the youngest lieutenant colonel I ever met in my life. <laughs> hey, Andy, take a look. See, that's what you're supposed to look when you retire. All right. Yes. Right. So we need more people that know how to do computer engineering. So that's, that's what we're trying to accomplish here at USM is developing and expanding our computer engineering uh, degree program. Do you realize that this is more powerful than the first computer I ever bought? A thousand times more com powerful and does a million more things than I could ever do with that compact that I spent a whole lot money more for than I did for this iPhone. All right. So how many believe that they may or may not actually join the military? Does anybody have the inkling to raise their hand, go to OCS or offer officer candidate school or some military? You, you guys do? What is it that you want to do? 
You want to be in the Marine Corps? Semper Fi. What about you? Air Force Academy. I was, I was stationed by there at Fort Carson. I'll get back to you, Lieutenant Colonel. Oh, you want to be a Ranger? Outstanding. You want Annapolis? Marine or Air Force. Well, they both fly, you know that, right? I think actually the Marine probably has more planes and helicopters than the Air Force does. Who else had their hands up? I saw you. I can't hear, I'm old. The United States Army. Whoop. So what do you want to be in the Army? And she looked like she was wearing Sergeant Major stripes or first sergeant. I can't say here. Sergeant Major? You're the youngest Sergeant Major I ever met. Navy. The United States Navy. You know, I was stationed, I spent more time on a Navy base than I did at an Army post. Mississippi National Guard. You're going to be out here at Camp Shelby? So, what are you, are you going to go to Southern? Hey, we got a U.S., a future U.S., and what are you going to study? Law. Law. All right, you need to talk to Jacob. Yes, young man. Uh, I want to You're going to learn how to balance a red ball? <laughs> Army National Guard? What do you want to do? I want to work with the canine You want to be a canine handler? Huh? That's what I thought I was going to do. And then I became a bomb tech. Navy. What do you want to be in the Navy? Officer. An officer. So there's 154 jobs in the United States Navy. Which one of those 154 jobs do you want to do? What do you want to do? Uh, well, I'm looking at trying to get an officer in the Navy. Uh, my uncle, my step-uncle, is an officer. He's trying to help me out. So to be an officer, you, you're going to have to have a specialty. So, you know, so... Where's the Colonel? What, what's what was your specialty in the or still is in the in the army? In the army, I was a transportation officer. Transportation. So it's it's great that you want to be an officer, but you got to pick a a specialty in which you wish to serve in, and then as you get your degree, become an expert within that, and the military will give you that working knowledge of how to do it. Does that make sense? Who else? Did I miss anybody else? Yes, Lieutenant Colonel. A ranger. Nobody wants to be an EOD guy, huh? <laughs> Go blow stuff up. I had fun, I'll tell you what. But so <laughs> so now what it is is that I will uh, I will now answer your questions. And how are we doing on time? Are we okay, Julie? Yeah, yeah, come on. So is there any questions from you? Uh, you can ask me anything and I'll tell you if it's out of bounds. No questions? Yes? Communications? Like, you mentioned how you've been studying, like, the internet and stuff. So how did you get involved in that? Well, the funny thing is that when I was in the Army, there's this thing about being promoted. And, and I loved being a staff sergeant and a team leader on that EOD team. But I also wanted to get promoted to make more money. So I went back to college and worked on a degree in computer science and earned that degree to get promoted. And then I never went, never went into computer science. So. Do we have an ROTC program? Where is? I can't hear you. Do we offer scholarships at the ROTC program? I don't know. USM does have a very strong uh, ROTC program, and they do offer scholarships as well. Many of our former cadets are now cadets in the USM ROTC program.
let me put it to you this way. If you go to school for four years at University of Southern Mississippi as a cadet, and you go to say, I want to join the Army and be a nurse, you're going to say you're already licensed? Yes. They'll say, thank you very much, Lieutenant. What's your last name? Bates. That's it. Lieutenant Bates, welcome to the United States Army. But you'll have to do Army training, of course. Yeah, trust me, they, they'll most likely take you as a nurse. Other questions? Hey, hey, Dan, only way to be a nurse in the Army is to go through a four-year nursing school. You so USM. Go in the Army with a nursing degree. Nursing. You cannot go in the Army and be a nurse with a two-year nursing degree. It will not take you. RN is. The school has to be NLN accredited. Yeah. NLN, National League of Nurses. Nick and all that other. And my wife's a nurse, so. Yeah. <laughs> other questions? I've got one. What overseas tour did you have? Oh, boy. All right. Overseas. I was stationed in Germany in 1983 to 1985. Then I went to Panama, Korea, went to a little place called, like named El Salvador, another place called Saudi Arabia, um, another place I went to, I think that's it. What's the one, JF, JTF? Honduras? No, not JTF. Honduras, the other one in Kuwait, the Joint Forces, I don't think they have it anymore over in Egypt. JFO. So, but I, because of my job in the military, one of the things that we were tasked with is provide presidential protection through the United States Secret Service. So, I might have been stationed in these different countries. However, I'd been deployed with the Secret Service all around the world China, um, Russia, well, back then it was the Soviet Union. Switzerland, France, you name it, with the different presidents on overseas trips and the Secretary of State. Did you pick up any other languages? None that I can repeat here, young lady. <laughs> I know how to get a fork, a knife, thank you, but don't ask me, to, don't put me on the spot now because I won't, they don't remember. But yes, you, if you go to Germany, you have to go to a school called Head Start, and I think they have that in every country that you go to, so you learn how to order from a menu, hail a cab, don't get lost in the train station. So they do offer that. What presidents have I met? I haven't actually met any presidents. It is, usually the president of the United States don't go up to the Secret Service protection detail and say, hey, my name, except once. And that was Clinton. But we, trust me, we're backing away to get away from him. Cause don't want to get caught up in that mess. How did I get recommended? Well, that was the Army's mission was to provide that mission to the Secret Service and protection of. So I didn't say, hey, I want to go work for the Secret Service because I'm a bomb tech. Is that, hey, you're going to go buy a suit and you're going to go to work with President Reagan while he's on vacation for six weeks in Monterey Bay and watch him ride horses. It's, you do what you're told in the United States military. No other questions? Well, thank you all. Enjoy. You will see me again tomorrow morning. I will not look this formal, but you'll see me throughout the day. If you have any questions, that, you got a question? You got one more question? I can't hear you. Do I still have my uniform from the Army? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Can I, uh, what, my BDUs? I, I think I have BDUs still, yes. I, I will see if I can find it. Because uh, I'm not going to wear my Class A uniform. It's, it was the polyester green uniform, and it's too hot, all right? Because everybody knows what I mean, all right? Other questions? Because I can't. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.